Shit's fucked. Not the way you imagined it, but it's invariably on a bad trajectory. When you imagined the beginning of Collapse, you had run a bunch of different scenarios in your head. That Collapse would be aggressive, it would take no prisoners. Instead, the best word you could use to describe it would be, well, slow. Suspended, even. Things are, well, kind of normal, but most definitely not what anyone would define as normal not very long ago. The power works, mostly, and the tap water continues to flow, but now with a subtle scent and flavoring in between drinking water from an old plastic bottle and pool water. And Facebook and Instagram are still up and running. Two things are impossible to find, garden seeds and coffee. So instead of coffee, you sip on mint tea. Mint is plentiful in an old flower bed outside your building, and to be completely honest, it's one of the only plants you've been confident identifying enough to ingest. And, well, despite not having been a fan of mint flavor, the water hasn't been that great, so anything to cover it up is pretty appealing for the time being. You start thinking about a girl you dated in college. She was your typical white girl who liked to cosplay in the vein of witchcraft, collecting herbs and making tinctures without actually ever using them. It was mostly performative, and you guess she probably grew out of it but you start to wonder how useful those books on medicinal herbs would be right now. On top of her stack of various general witchery books was Faulkner's Absalom Absalom, the copy you lent her for the class you had taken with her roommate. You continue to drift from memory to memory, not recalling the premise of the novel itself, but rather the lack of existence that existed within the narrative. Faulkner's novel highlighted the impact catastrophe has on community in the chilling suspension of commerce. Food and basic necessities became limited to the bare minimum, and the goal becomes survival. And in not in any way that is gritty or glorifying. We aren't talking about the call of the wild, but instead of staving off boredom and suicidal thoughts as the days blend to weeks and to months. In some ways, it was easier to go off to war knowing you were struggling and possibly dying for a cause than to simply exist, waiting for someone to say things are going to change back, and maybe not even back to normal, but just for things to become meaningful again, to no longer be caught in suspended time. You look out the window and see a few folks from your building digging in what used to be the backyard. There aren't many people left in the building. Somehow rent has gone up despite the fact that most people are unemployed. You watch them frustrated and dirty, a couple of thin looking plants popping out of the ground like a splinter in the earth between them. You bought some seeds a few months ago, but instead traded them for some cigarettes and a promise of some produce. Looks like it's going well so far, you think, and light up. You knew it wouldn't be easy to grow plants. I mean, the soil has to be bad, with all the chemicals dumped into the ground in a city 300 years old. Down the street, there's a bright tie-dye sign hung from an abandoned lot. It reads, the resistance starts underground. And there are a few punk kids squatting out on the lot, some with shovels and rakes, but they only seem to be growing weeds. The revolution better start underground, you think, because nothing was happening above ground. Or... Was it? Hey folks, this is Andy with the Poor Proles Almanac. And despite it only being the second episode, I feel as though we need to backtrack. When we started this podcast, it was the beginning of COVID, and we had no idea what that would mean in the long term. We were aware that what was happening wouldn't be sustainable indefinitely, and all it would take is for something like, well, this, to show how quickly it would unravel. Our original goal, before COVID had even struck, was to look at history to create an evidence-based approach to see what has happened in the past, what has worked, and what hasn't worked, 
and to bring to the table some of our skills in an effort to bring on board folks dipping their toes into the water on the subject. As a former teacher, it was important to me to make sure folks listening had a basic framework of knowledge to understand the lens we were viewing this specific challenge through. We were about six episodes in, in terms of material, and we were preparing the equipment, getting the website made up, you know, all that fun stuff, and the reports of COVID had started appearing on the news. We were excited to get this stuff recorded, and we kept moving forward, and I recorded the trailer, as well as the first few episodes material for my side of things, just to get acclimated to the recording and editing process. Fast forward two months later, and we had been on lockdown, and for the first time in my life, folks like us, folks that had always felt it was necessary to be prepared for the worst, were becoming invaluable members of our communities. Leftist groups focused on skill sharing, prepping, and mutual aid doubled and tripled in a matter of days. We decided at that time, if not now, when would be a better time to get this out there. We made a conscious decision to roll with a few preliminary episodes outlining the nature-focused areas of prepping, which is generally my area of expertise, and I use the term expertise pretty loosely. Even though the content we put in the first episode was recorded without the intent of publishing it, we cleaned it up as best we could and put it out there. Now, over a year later, I'm re-recording this content. Looking back at what we've accomplished has been surreal. And if you're listening to this and you didn't hear the first one, good for you. We've learned a lot about recording, improved our quality, and all of that, and figured out how to talk to a microphone. So at this point, I think it's worth relooking at a lot of this content and giving it a little bit of an update. In regards to the first episode that we had recently released, I am a strong believer that nature and its efficiency provides a blueprint for how we can create sustainable, resilient societies. That doesn't mean we have to go live in huts or earth houses, but it does mean we have to live in a manner that is considerate of the long-term implications of our decisions. So if that sounds interesting to you, keep listening. You can find our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support us on Instagram and Facebook, where we post memes and constant updates on what's going on with the podcast itself. If you really enjoy what we're doing and want to support us, we also have a Patreon, and that helps cover the cost of hosting the podcast and all the other stuff that goes into making the quality as good as we possibly can. It sucks to ask for money, but yay capitalism. So part of the reason we wanted to jump into soil is because that's where everything begins. By understanding the climate and the challenges that are coming with it, the only thing we can control is the soil and what grows out of it. And what grows out of it is directly proportional to the quality of the soil that we're working with. What's become really apparent is that we need to focus on creating those anti-entropic systems, which put things back into the environment. In this case, more specifically, into the soil. For context, over the last 40 years, we have abandoned about a third of the arable land that we had previously farmed on because it is no longer capable of hosting plants. The UN Global State of Soil Assessment estimates that humanity loses about 0.3% of our global food production capacity each year to soil erosion. While that may not seem like a big number, we're on track to destroy all of our arable soil once you factor in the growth of human population within the next 75 years. Our traditional farming processes not only destroy the soils quickly, we are actually doing this so quickly that we're making soil disappear up to an inch a decade. And in some extreme examples, soils have been decimated at an inch a year. That's a problem, right? So we have to do the opposite of that. We have to rebuild those soils. And in order to do that, we need to understand this basic concept, which I think we do. And then we've got to figure out what the fuck we want to put in the soil to make our plants grow big and strong. The first thing we need to understand is what's in our soil. 
and what's in our air because those things are both interconnected. Let's start with the obvious stuff. When we go out and buy fertilizer to feed our tomato plants, what is it doing to help our soil? NPK. Those numbers are on the front of the bags of fertilizer you might be buying, and they stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The big one everyone knows is nitrogen, which conveniently is about 78% of our atmosphere. And if you're not green to gardening, then you know there are some plants that actually provide nitrogen for you, free of charge. Well, not actually. The plants can't, but certain plants are able to host certain rhizobial bacteria, which can convert the insoluble nitrogen in the air into a soluble form for plants. The plants provide carbon for the bacteria, which all plants produce in photosynthesis. And carbon is the foundation of how all soil works. So when we were saying that we were losing like an inch a year or an inch a decade in our soil, what that really was is the carbon that's being lost from the soil. So nitrogen is a crucial element for plants to be able to photosynthesize. Without it, plants will grow slowly and usually will have a tinge of yellow to them. Too much nitrogen and you'll see the plants usually grow thick and bushy with dark leaves, which will sometimes get thick and leathery. When there's too much nitrogen, you'll usually get a poor fruit volume from the plant you're growing, which is common in planter gardening because in nature, the excess nitrogen will wash away, while in a planter, it can't go anywhere. What you'll usually see if there's way too much nitrogen is the leaves will also start curling down. So that's a pretty good indicator that you might want to cut back on the feeding. Phosphorus, in contrast, is a crucial element for root and fruit development. When there's not enough phosphorus, you'll see some purpling in the veins. However, when there's too much phosphorus, the plant will struggle pulling other nutrients from the soil, causing yellowing leaves and stunted growth. The problem with phosphorus additions to soil is that it will not wash away and can build up in the soil for years. Further, it can limit the fungi of the soil's ability to interact with the plant, forcing the plant to struggle even further. It's definitely the one that you're better off not adding it if you're not positive that you need it. Potassium, the third major element, is important for cellular functions, pest resistance, and temperature resistance, as well as maintaining the water flow within the plant. Plants tend to try to take up as much potassium as they can store in the spring to have a reserve to handle the ebbs and flows of the summer season's weather. When potassium levels are low within a plant, many of the green new growth branches will begin to hollow out as the water pressure is left unchecked and the leaf tips will turn yellow and sometimes appear burnt. Which, if you think about it, makes sense if there's no water regulation. The water cannot make its way to the very ends of the plant. What's interesting is that the plant is aware of this deficiency and sacrifices the lower leaves, which pushes the resources available to the new growth, which is where the bulk of photosynthesis is happening. Too much potassium blocks the flow of other nutrients like calcium, magnesium, and nitrogen. Now, most people will want to dig into these different nutrients and try to understand as much as they can about the chemistry of how plants work, but that really isn't the way I want to think about it because we're not feeding our plants in any traditional way. We're focusing instead on providing a good soil biology. But since these are the big three fertilizer inputs that we do commonly see and the average backyard gardener is familiar with, it's worth talking about. You will see evidence of these types of problems. Not long ago, this was the depth of our understanding of plant science, and that's why we saw the industrial petrochemical complex develop as the soils degraded. But then, something weird happened. We had pest issues like never before. Some of it, sure, was due to monocrops lacking diversity of inputs, so the limited biology destroyed any sense of complex systems in place to keep various pests in check. But Another major factor was the lack of good microbes within the soil. 
the mutualistic relationship between the plant and the microbes in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, and microanthropods was destroyed and the plant couldn't defend itself. So what makes a healthy soil? Let's narrow that question down a little further, and that is what makes a healthy biological community in the soil? Covered soil surface, diversity, decaying organic matter, good soil drainage, and minimal or no soil disturbance. Your ears might be perking up at that list because each of those either goes right in the face of traditional farming as we know it, or should remind you an awful lot of those nested systems we had talked about in the previous episode on complex systems theory. What this is, really, is a nutrient cycle system. The soil food web starts with the sun, which is photosynthesized by plants, capturing carbon in their roots and processing the carbon into sugars. The sugars travel through the roots and the plants, essentially trading the sugars through diffusion with the biology of the soil, and what's called the rhizosphere, where the roots, fungi, and bacteria live. These proto-cooperative and mutualist relationships sound awfully familiar, right? This sounds like the complex systems we've been talking about. We need the biology to retain and hold nutrients in the soil, and that's what bacteria and fungi does within the soil. These bacteria and fungi demand organic matter to survive, and that material is provided by the plants so the relationship is very much a mutualist one. When the plants release their sugars and other compounds, mostly protein and carbohydrates, into the soil, what are called exudates, the plant releases the compounds related to the specific nutrients that they need. If they need, say, iron, they release a specific compound which helps the beneficial bacteria or fungi necessary to provide that nutrient in soluble form. So the bacteria and fungi take the exudates from the plant and work the soil to make it more aerobic and accessible for the plant roots so that the roots can continue to feed them. However, bacteria and fungi will kill the plant if they are left alone because a system of checks and balances needs to be in place to keep these from feeding too heavily from the plant. There are bacteria and fungi predators such as protozoa, nematodes, and microarthropods, which are attracted to the root systems of plants, since that is where the bacteria feed, and they eat the bacteria, releasing soluble nutrients for the plant to absorb. Nitrogen is released as ammonia, phosphorus as phosphate, sulfur as sulfate, calcium as chelated calcium, and so on and so on. There are 42 necessary nutrients for plants to grow, and possibly more, and the bacteria and fungi can provide all of them. But for them to be successful in providing these nutrients, there needs to be a full ecosystem to provide the environment for these organisms to be successful in the soil. Anaerobic soils on the opposite end of the spectrum release all of those nutrients, the sulfates, the phosphates, and so on, back into the air, killing the life-producing nutrients. If too many protozoa, nematodes, and microarthropods develop because they are left unchecked, they will wipe out the fungi and bacteria, creating an anaerobic soil. So what keeps these guys in check? That's where your bugs, spiders, and mites come into play, and the transition into our traditional food web as we think of it begins to take hold from the world beneath our feet. In this discussion about soil, bacteria, and fungi, there seems to be one thing that we have managed not to bring up, and it's one of the first things folks think of when discussing healthy soils. Worms. And worms do play a huge part of soil health. Worms can move about 1 to 100 tons of soil to the surface per acre each year. This process not only helps aerate the soil, but helps soil retain moisture during downpours, reducing runoff, and they function as nature's plow tilling up subsoil and mixing it with the new organic residues. Further, earthworms in particular are surface feeders, which works well when you're dropping lots of organic matter on the surface of your soil to build the organic material of your topsoil. 
Studies have shown that earthworms are more plentiful under no-till practices, that is, those farms where the soil isn't tilled over, than under conventional tillage systems, meaning that they are more capable of supporting soil health when you leave the soil alone. Further, many diseases that overwinter on leaves of crops can often, although not always, be controlled by high earthworm populations because the worms eat the leaves and incorporate the residues deep into the soil. Additionally, let's talk a little bit about what having this complex system provides. Healthy soils create complex systems which regulate negative insects for your plants, inhibit disease, and provide structure. Healthy aerobic soils, meaning soils with large amounts of oxygen, and what we call a healthy food web, not only suppress disease, but help soil reduce water use, and in fact can even increase the capacity the soil has to retain moisture, which helps recycle nutrients within itself and keeps nutrients available for plants when needed longer, eliminating petrochemical fertilizer use and reducing runoff. We build soil structure with the help of bacteria, which is the primary agent in this process. Bacteria create what's called microaggregates, which are the smallest structure in our soil, and operate as a glue almost in the soil. You know, you've seen those pictures of people with a handful of soil and it looks like it's almost chunky, right? It's so healthy and dark. You don't know why, but it's just glorious. It's those microaggregates that provide that texture, and the fungi collects these microaggregates and using glenolin, which is essentially fungus glue, to develop its networks and to create passages for oxygen to stay absorbed within the soil itself. The crazy part of this is that organic matter like this is only up to 5% of the entire soil content, and biological organisms only comprise 1% of the total soil content. So to build healthy soil, we need to know where to start. This requires doing a soil test or doing some kind of approximation to figure out what the condition of the soil is, which we can do with a relatively inexpensive microscope like a couple hundred bucks. Temperatures of the soil significantly impacts what species of bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, and so on are actively living in your soil at any given moment. One tablespoon of soil has about 75,000 different species of bacteria. It's impossible to wrap your head around the amount of diversity within our soil and its microbiology. And we know almost nothing about these species because we cannot recreate them in a lab. We have documented about 5,000 different types of bacteria, despite knowing about so many more. Now, this is where I might lose some people. Do you want to know the health of your soil, or your compost, or maybe even your pond? Sure, you could send off a sample somewhere, and it will be helpful to know, but as you probably already know, your property isn't homogenous. There are dry areas, wet areas, sunny areas, and shaded areas, all which are impacted by the plants and the dirt of those spots. Well, you could buy a microscope and figure out what's in the soil on your own. Sure, you're not a scientist, neither am I. But if you're thinking about a long-term investment in your soil, this is one place to start. With a microscope, you'll be able to tell the health of a soil through the microorganisms that exist within it. When you look at a nematode, how do you know whether or not it's beneficial? You can tell by whether it has a horn to puncture fungi roots. Horns are bad for your fungi. Root-eating nematodes only exist within anaerobic soils, so you know when you see these giant horned nematodes, you've got problems. If you see other types of nematodes, such as ciliates in the soil, you've got anaerobic soil. If you see evidence of a honey tan material in your sample, you're seeing what's called fulvic acid, which is decomposed plant material that's been broken down and stored by fungi. Any dark brown material you might see is humic acids, which, much like fulvic acid, is decomposed nutrients from plants that are readily available for plants and fungi. This stuff can be stored for hundreds of years.
So if you're seeing this, but still have evidence of bad nematodes, then you know your soil was healthy, but now isn't. And now you understand the history of your soil sample. And you can do this across your property an unlimited amount of times, and you can use this process to trial and error different solutions to figure out if you're helping or hurting your soil, instead of just saying, well, I guess my tomato plants grew better than this year. I don't know if it was what I did to the soil or the temperature or the sun or any of the other million things that can impact plant growth. There's a bunch of things that you can look for under a microscope and I'm not here to teach you how to use one because that's obviously ridiculous. But for a lot of folks, including myself, who think things like microscopes aren't for me, I'm not a science guy, I'm a woods guy. I spend most of my time when I have free time with my sheep, chickens, ducks, turkeys, and all the other wildlife that's around me. But I can use a microscope too. You can pick up a microscope that can look at bacteria at 1,000 times for less than about 150 bucks. One soil sample will probably run you 20 to $40. So for the cost of, say, eight soil samples, you've already broken even. But if you can't, or you're simply not that invested in your soil at this time, you're absolutely better off doing a traditional soil test than just eyeballing it. Especially if you're a first-time gardener. Most states have extension schools which offer free testing, or for a menial amount, they'll test your soil. The only catch is that they're designed to support usually small grain farmers, and their focus is on helping them maximize profits, which often means they aren't going to recommend you plant cover crops for increased nitrogen, for example. But they'll usually tell you what kind of fertilizer you need, and they'll usually recommend a high amount to meet those demands. So chances are you'll have to do a little bit of translation of their recommendations. If it's your first time doing a soil sample, you want to do different samples in different areas of your garden that you expect to have different results. Near a drainage ditch is likely going to yield significantly different results from the area next to your pool or the place next to your driveway. Further, if you live someplace where there might have been an old farm, you're going to see a lot of diversity based on what was growing where. If you want the best results possible, you want to use a trowel to dig down to a spot of about 4 to 6 inches or to the depth of the roots for most grasses and annuals, and filter out the rocks and sticks. Mix up the soil so the topsoil is mixed with what was down 6 inches, and take a small amount from that to send in. Usually your soil sample size will be fairly small, and that's why you need to be sure to mix it well. Now, there's a very big part of soil that we haven't talked about yet, and it's the inorganic matter called dirt. Folks, including myself, often use these terms interchangeably, but that's not really a good habit, because soil is the web of life around the ground, while dirt is the conditions that the soil lives within. The sand, the silt, and the clay, the mineral piece of the soil composition. This is important and something we hear too often, especially on YouTube. Some suburbanite creates a channel will say, we did the Ruth Stout method and turned our clay backyard into beautiful, healthy soil. Well, yes, you may have created some great soil, but you didn't turn the clay into anything. It's still there. There's just an increased amount of organic matter wrapped up in it. The quality and texture may be similarly like a loam, but it's the biological element which creates the ability of dirt to harbor life and be a successful medium for plants to grow successfully. Generally speaking, the dirt in your soil is composed of one or a mix of gravel, sand, silts, and clay, and those are in order from biggest to smallest, gravel, sand, silts, and clay. The bigger of the two, gravel and sand, are significantly larger, like a hundred times larger than silt and clay. And if you think about that for a second, the larger the soil material is, the better it drains because you've got more space between each individual particle. So sand drains pretty good. Clay, not so much. If you want to figure out what you have, get three tablespoons of moist soil and form a ball. If it falls apart, you've got sandy soil. If it forms more of a ribbon, like it maintains some of its structure, it's silty sand. And if it stays a ball, it's likely clay. 
So water absorption is significantly impacted by dirt content. But soil compaction, smaller material can compact more tightly, impacting soil aeration, which is a major factor in the biology of the soil. This is not to say there is no benefit to clay soil, which is the smallest material of the four. Clay is actually superior at holding nutrients and can be a very good material for soil. Now, everyone going back to like third grade can remember when we all learned about the different layers of different, let's call it, stuff in the ground. Well, we're going to do a very quick refresher because while I'm sure you all remember everything from every grade of schooling, I don't. These different layers are often called horizons. For most of us, the first two layers are what we are farming, unless we're working with raised beds. But even still, as we move soil, it's important to know what we're moving and what we should be moving. Those two layers can be three inches or feet deep. The first layer is organic matter, the recently decomposed and the actively decomposing stuff. The second is the nutrient-rich layer, which is that dark, lovely soil we all hope to find when we start digging into the garden. The third is called the fluvial layer, which is a leached layer. The fourth is a mineral-rich layer. The fifth is the transitional layer. And the sixth is the parent material. Whatever base material is in the soil, where that mineral layer, the sand, the rock, whatever came from, the last four layers, for simple purposes, are simply gradations of the parent material blending with the organic material. So the big thing we have been referring back to in the value of dirt is how it impacts water, so let's swing over to that direction. About 25% of the content in your soil should be water. There are two ways water is held in soil. Cohesion, which is water sticking to itself, and adhesion which is water sticking to the matter in the soil. With wet soil, water will hold on to itself and soil particles. As the soil dries out, particles grab to each other instead of going into the soil. I know it seems kind of ridiculous, but think about your houseplants. If you're like me, you love the idea of houseplants, but are terrible about watering them because you always feel like you just watered them. Then you see they're dying and you rush to water them and the water sits on the top of the pot after you pour way too much in. Then it drains out of the bottom all over your sideboard, and an hour later, the soil looks dry again. While some of that is probably the perlite in the potting mix, a large piece of what it is is what we just described, as well as what's called surface crust, which is exactly what it sounds like, which is gross. Soil in this sense can exist in three different states. Saturated, which is when the water can no longer be retained and runoff begins, which has lots of problems, namely nutrient loss, topsoil loss, and usually damage to the plants growing in that soil, because that means there's a limited, if any, amount of oxygen in the soil, and you're likely facing a massive case of root rot and other various diseases in the near future. The opposite state is the permanent wilting point which is much like our poor houseplants dying in the corner. The soil is nearly incapable of breaking the strong bonds within itself to have any adhesion with the water, reinforcing its sad state. Field capacity is the middle ground. The soil is moist and capable of taking more water, while still being full of oxygen and providing the plants and beneficial bugs with everything they need to survive. Oftentimes, Folks will think they have clay beneath their soil or think that their soil is saturated because they have massive water buildup in weird places. Think like a giant puddle on the top of a hill. However, sometimes this can be from plow pans, which is when plowing has compacted the soil below the plow, giving aerated soil above the plow pan, but once that plowed soil has been saturated, you're experiencing runoff which means your soil is actually holding less water than you think it is, since your mineral layer is often much deeper than where you'd find a plow pan. But not always. This difference matters because you can improve this situation with good soil health, whereas there's not much you can do other than build more soil when your mineral layer is close to the surface. The first step in figuring out what's going on with your soil is 
is to look at your drainage classification, which ranges from, you guessed it, well-drained to poorly drained. Very technical, I know. Sandy soil is probably going to be well-drained, while your clay and silty clays are pretty poorly drained. If you're digging into your soil and see sand, you probably know what sand looks like. Remember, you want to get below the hummus layer, which may be inches to a foot or so deep, before you get more of the sediment from the mineral layer. You probably know what sand looks like, grain, brownish, maybe a light brown. Your silt, if you have lots of it, will be more gray, tan, and creamy, and maybe even blackish material, and it's a very fine material. Again, you can try to roll it into a ball to confirm the content. Clay soils, by contrast, are usually a yellow or red color. If you come across a blue clay, it's not actually clay, but silt that has had water trapped in the soil where oxygen has gotten into it and the soil has gone anaerobic. With all this knowledge, you can start to get a better sense of why your soil might not be draining, and if your soil seems to be good, you might want to consider that you have a plow pan causing poor drainage. So let's talk about the air in the soil, which should constitute about 25% of the soil content. We discussed the insects and bacteria, the aggregates, that can help aerate the soil from their relationship with plants. Additionally, there are a few other ways air builds up in soil. One is from older root pathways that have died and broken down, and other is from the shifts in the soil creating new spaces between soil particles, and the last is simply from the absence of water, like what we were talking about a few minutes ago. These points where air can exist within the soil are crucial for soil development and are often indicators of healthy soil in themselves. While air may seem like an obvious need for plants and the various bacteria and fungi that live within the soil, they too need oxygen. The other challenge comes from the ability to release harmful secretions that then release back into the air. This is why it's important for the soil to be able to absorb moisture, retain it, but also work like a sponge, keeping the soil both aerated and moist. Contrary to what you might believe, the problem with clay soil isn't just that it's like a rock and roots struggle to break through it, but it actually absorbs water, leaving no pockets of air for roots and the beneficial creatures within the soil. Anyways, okay, so now you kind of have an idea of what's in the soil and sort of how it functions. Now, there's a lot of middle ground between great soil and dirt. As you might expect, there's an evolutionary process for the soil as it goes from good to bad. The succession of the soil food web from being inhabitable to creating dynamic, healthy soil has certain evidence, and it's something you can use as a framework as you assess your soil. And for bonus points, it ties right back into the complex systems we had talked about when we were talking global warming. Let's start kind of at the bare bones beginning. If you see soil where nothing can grow, there's no fungi to create and move soluble nutrients through the soil, there's only bacteria. When the weeds take over, they add some fungi to the soil to help break up the soil, but the soil is still primarily bacterial, and generally in these situations, they have a lot of nitrates. Because of the limited amounts of fungi, Weeds do exceptionally well in compacted soils, where nothing else will grow. So if you've ever had an above-ground pool and tried to plant grass seed there, you probably notice grass really struggles afterwards, and the weeds just take over. The weeds will, however, eventually introduce enough fungi to break up the compact soil, and some grasses will begin to cohabitate the space with the weeds. What happens is that each species, the early grasses like Bermuda grass to the more traditional grasses, each of these adds more and different fungi to the environment, which helps further break up the soil, adds new dead material to the soil, creates more complex fungi networks, and brings the ratios of bacteria and fungi to a place where there is equal or more fungi to bacteria, while absorbing much of the nitrates within the soil. When fungi to bacteria levels are equal, we are in a great place for growing most of our traditional crops, grains, tomatoes, etc. As the fungi outpaces the bacteria, we move from shrubs at a 2 to 1 ratio and a 5 to 1 ratio to trees 
that are a 5 to 1 ratio to 100 to 1 ratios, and ultimately old growth forests where fungi can outnumber bacteria 1000 to 1. Now to put that number in perspective, within a gram of soil in an old growth forest, almost 70% of that bit of soil you picked up is fungi. It's not that bacteria is leaving the soil that makes the soil healthy, because they're not leaving. It's the fungi is increasing in number. So, you want as much fungi as possible in the soil, right? Well, no. It depends on what you're trying to grow, actually. Look at a blueberry bush. It's a bush, so your first response might be, well, maybe in that 2 to 5 to 1 ratio of fungi to bacteria. Well, that makes sense, but it's not entirely accurate. Because blueberries tend to live in pine-dense deciduous forests that are prone to burning, so their ideal fungi to bacteria ratio is probably really in that 5 to 1 to 100 to 1 range, maybe at the high end of that range. By understanding this relationship, you're able to plan, plant, and contextualize what's going on with the plants in your soil. Further, it's important to understand that when we talk about these relationships, much like when we were talking about testing the soil in different spots, as you evolve your soil with your work, the soil will also have those variations. So just because you're planting one tree in one place next to a bush, because that tree might have that 500 to 1 ratio or whatever it might be, that bush, even if it's 5 feet away, might have a significantly smaller fungi to soil ratio. So it's important not to get too caught up in this concept, but to understand it's there and use it as a general framework for this conversation. So let's circle back a little bit to these ratios. What's important to understand is while the ratio is important, the actual volume of bacteria and fungi matters as well. If we go from, say, a 300 microgram 1 to 1 ratio of bacteria and fungi content in a soil to 400 microgram, crop sizes increase 30%. What that means is as the volume of bacteria and fungi increase in the soil, the plants are growing better. If we continue going up, we can double our production or more because of faster nutrient cycling and everything is healthier. And here's the thing, if you maintain the biology of the soil, you can continue to get those results. Let me say that again, you can maintain those results without the use of added fertilizer. Think of it this way. Essentially what the fungi and bacteria do is create a funnel. The more of them that exist, the bigger that funnel is into the plant. So that's what we're thinking about is creating a bigger funnel. Now in this shift from low fungi to high fungi soils, we have impacts on the rest of the soil matter, including its pH. pH of high fungi soils are naturally acidic. If you're not familiar with that term, it means the soil has a pH below 5.5 or so. In this type of soil, it can often be harder for grasses and other annuals to grow in. It's the same reason you might struggle to get grass to grow underneath trees in your backyard, even if you have good lighting getting in. Again, think of those relationships between grasses, trees, fungi, and bacteria. High pH soils, in contrast, are primarily bacteria-driven, which is why grasses do better in these types of environments. When fungi grows, they release organic acids between 5.5 and 7 pH. So, when fungi grows, they release organic acids between 4 and 7 pH. Fungi are the key indicator of your soil being balanced. However, there are other pieces, including the minerals that are in the soil, that can impact pH, which we will end up highlighting when we talk about being guided by our local ecological conditions as we try to build out the food systems that we imagine. Further, the NH4, that is the ammonium of the fungi and bacteria that is eaten by nematodes and microanthropods, is released back as NH4. Without the fungi, however, the hydrogen is released from the NH4 and replaced with oxygen, which helps promote weeds instead of more complex, demanding plants.
On the subject of pH, it's important to understand that many essential nutrients are not soluble in large amounts in soils with excessively high or low pH. The most benefit comes from soil in that 6 to 7 pH range. If you've heard folks say that adding lime to your soil is like adding fertilizer, this is what they mean. The nutrients are essentially becoming unlocked to your plants. What I'm saying here is that we don't need fertilizers, not the traditional ones anyway. They don't really fix any of the problems. What works is to understand the big picture of what's happening in order to figure out how to fix the situation using natural resources. And I really hate to use the term natural because it's so slippery to pin exactly what a company means when they use the word natural. So I really hate to use it. But solutions that come from materials that you can get your hands on, that's what I'm talking about here. And I think it's right about here that it's time to wrap up this part of soil biology. We've covered a good portion of the basics of soil biology and chemistry, and you already now know more than 99% of people and probably 75% of gardeners when it comes to what's going on in the soil. In our next episode, we're going to dive in a bit on cover crops, keeping your soil from having water problems, and the no-till revolution. And if you enjoyed this content, please give us a review on iTunes. Until next time, this is Andy, and this is the Poor Proles Almanac.